We are going to talk about number to call us, 888-589-8840, by the way, 888-589-8840. If you'd like to join the program on this free for all uh, Friday, I want to talk a little bit about the death of Christopher Hitchens. Christopher Hitchens died yesterday of esophageal cancer. He was a committed, in fact, he was described in one of the accounts of his death as a militant atheist. So he died yesterday at the age of 61. Uh, perhaps the most prominent atheist in the world, what really gave him a lot of attention was a publication of a book in 2007 entitled God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. So Christopher Hitchens, for the last four or five years of his life, spent a good deal of time debating the very existence of God and debating belief with believers. And by every account that I have been able to read, I read quite a bit about him this morning, he died perfectly and contentedly unrepentant. Now, uh, Dave, Richard Dawkins, who is perhaps the other leading atheist in the world today, said that Christopher Hitchens, quote, was a valiant fighter against all tyrants, including imaginary supernatural ones. So this is an interesting thing to me that here Dawkins is indicating that Hitchens believed that supernatural tyrants were imaginary, that they did not exist, and yet he spent the bulk of his adult life fighting against a totally imaginary figure. Uh, now, you stop and think about that from a rational standpoint. It does not make a whole lot of sense. Uh, Hitchens hated the Pope. Uh, amazingly, his hatred of Catholicism ran so deep that he even spent a good deal of time smearing Mother Teresa, if you can believe that. Here is a paragraph from an obituary about him that I came across in the Washington Times this morning. Hitchens publicly vowed to be true to his atheism. A public appeal by his old friend and sometime partner in crime and debauchery, the author Martin Amos, that Hitchens reconsider and become an agnostic. I mean, what, what Amos was saying was, I, I don't even want you to become a believer. Just how about moving from atheism, saying there is no God, to become an, an agnostic and saying at least I don't know. There might be a God, I don't think there is one, but I don't know. But that appeal, so far as has been reported, went unanswered. Instead, Hitchens said to an interviewer that if, after his death, it's reported that the militant atheist Christopher Hitchens experienced a deathbed conversion, a la Brideshead Revisited, we are to know that his mind gave way at the end. So he says, look, if you hear that I had some kind of come to Jesus moment on my deathbed, the only thing you can take away from that is that I lost my mind at the end of my life. Uh, the AP article I read on his passing describes him, quote, as fully non-believing. So let's accept, and, and from everything I've read, I did not read a lot of Christopher Hitchens stuff. I was aware of him. I was aware of the debates. I was aware of the many Christians in his life that appealed to him to consider the claims of Jesus Christ. And apparently, from all we've been able to read, those appeals fell on deaf ears. So if we accept what Hitchens said about himself and what others said about him, that he died as committed to his atheism as he was at the height of his powers, what are we to say about Christopher Hitchens' eternal destination? Where is he today, and why is he there? Now, what I am suggesting, and, and I want you to hear me out on this. I want you to listen to me when I develop this theory for you. It's my opinion. Others may have a different way of looking at it. But I believe if we take the Scriptures at face value and we take Christopher Hitchens' own words at face value, then Christopher Hitchens is in hell today because he rejected, as we just read at the beginning of the program, he rejected the one mediator that exists between God and man, 
the man Christ Jesus. And if you look at the gospel, you understand that there is only one way for man to be set right with God. That the scripture says that we have all sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. That's in Romans 3.23. And therefore we have come under the wrath and the judgment and the eventual punishment of God. So God is a holy God. He is a just God. We are transgressors. We have broken his holy laws. We have violated them. We are, we are trespassers. We have transgressed his law. Because he is a holy God, those violations of his law must be punished. He cannot let crimes against his holy law go unpunished. We think li very little of a judge who would give a slap on the wrist to somebody who breaks the law. We say, no, that kind of behavior merits justice. It needs to be swift. It needs to be sure. And yet that sense of fairness and justice we got from God because we're made in his image. So God's a holy God. That sin cannot go unpunished. It has to be punished. His wrath has to fall on that sin. Now, the whole point of the gospel is that Jesus came to bear the wrath of God in our place. That sin demands punishment. The story of the gospel is that God laid on Jesus Christ the sins of us all. Every last bit of our sin, our shame, our despair, our humiliation, all of that was laid on Jesus Christ as a perfect and innocent substitute for us. And when, the, when all of the sins of the world, our sins were all laid upon his shoulders, and remember, Jesus is the only one who did not die for his own sins because he was sinless. The Scriptures tells us that he knew no sin, that he was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sins. You hear anybody say, especially any Christian say, that Jesus Christ sinned. An amazing number of Christians believe that, that he sinned in his life. Absolutely not true. The Scripture says repeatedly he was a man who knew no sin. That's why he could be a sin-bearer for us. He could bear the sin of the world because he himself did not need to die for his own sin. He's the only one that ever walked the earth who died, who could die for the sins of somebody else because it was not necessary for him to die for his own sins. Now, what this means is that if we will accept the substitutionary death of Christ on our behalf, then God does not need to punish us. His wrath does not need to fall upon us because it has been completely satisfied his justice has been completely satisfied in the person of Christ. If we take refuge at the foot of the cross, if we take refuge in the work of Christ on the cross, if we, we take refuge under the shed blood of Christ for our sins, God forgives, he restores, the barrier between us and God has been permanently removed. If we do not, if we do not embrace the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, if we do not embrace the one Savior, the only one who can possibly save us from our sins. Again, this is not arbitrary. This is just the way the universe works. We are talking about the God who is the creator of the universe. He is a holy God. He is a just God. He has set forward his commands for us. The violations of those have to be punished, just like violations of the law in our day have to be punished. And he's found a way for his wrath to be satisfied without us having, without us having to die for our own sins, but, there, but there's only one way that his wrath can be satisfied in our case if we accept the substitutionary death of Christ on our behalf. Now, Christopher Hitchens, by all accounts, did not. He rejected that offer of salvation. He had many people appealing to him to uh, accept the offer of Jesus Christ. He rejected it. This means that he has made a willing decision to endure God's wrath, endure God's punishment on his own. And if we take the scriptures at face value, then that is what he has experienced. Now, here's the point that I want to make. We can see how hell represents God's justice, represents his wrath. But I also want to suggest to you that hell ultimately is also an expression of God's love. Because God is love and God is just. And those two aspects of his character are always mingled together. He never acts one apart from the other. It's like when my kids needed to be spanked when they were kids, that was justice. I needed to do it. But I never told them, look, I love you, but I have to spank you. We would say to them, no, I love you, and because I love you, I must discipline you because I do not want you to become the kind of person that you would become if your misdeeds were not corrected. I have a responsibility to turn you into a responsible, mature adult. And discipline at this stage in your life is a part of that process. I would not be loving you if I did not do that. So love and justice are commingled. They exist together. God never does something.
that is not at the same time an expression not only of his justice, but also of his love. So in what sense, then, is the fact that Christopher Hitchens is in hell an expression of not only of God's justice, but of God's love? Now, here's what I would suggest is that the most loving thing as well as the most just thing that God could do for Christopher Hitchens is to send him to hell. Why do I say that? Because in the end, God has given to Mr. Hitchens what he most wanted in life. What Christopher Hitchens wanted was to be as separated from God as it was possible to be, to live as far away from God as it was possible to live. How, I say, would it possibly be a loving thing for God to force a man to live in his presence for all of eternity when that man has made it abundantly clear for his entire life that he does not want to be around you? How would it be a loving thing to force a man to live in your presence world without end when that man has declared defiantly to you and all the world that he wants nothing to do with you? He wants nothing to do with your son. He wants nothing to do with your truth. He wants nothing to do with your word. So I would suggest to compel someone against his will to spend eternity in the last place in the universe he wants to be, that that would be a form of cruelty. The real punishment for Mr. Hitchens would be for him to be assigned a place in heaven where he would have to endure the presence of a God he loathed for ages to come. So hell is both an expression of God's justice and of his love. In the end, the last words spoken are, Thy will be done. Either we say it to God or God says it to us.